What up all my MVPs and welcome back to my channel, Most Valuable Poets. As you know, I am on a hiatus, pushing a book. I'm still working with my press as my day gig. So what you have been seeing on my lately have been the performance videos because I am also working on perfecting my theatricalization of poetry, how, how to perform as a poet. I'll make sure to pop the performance playlist right up there. Now, what I'm going to do uh, during my journey of doing all these different things, I'm running into amazing, amazing, amazing people. And I am blessed and I'm gratified to have one of these amazing people with me today. And it comes in the body, in the spirit of Jesse Alvarez. Jesse, how are you today? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. You're going to see MVPs, uh, the relationship that Jesse and I have. Uh, both on a professional level and an artistic level, and that's kind of going to unfold over this meeting. So as all of you know, by clicking on this video, this is going to be about publishing, right? We're going to be talking directly with the publisher, which Jesse Alvarez is. Uh, Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to get into publishing? Well, I think it was more that I didn't see enough of those stories that I knew were out there, that I knew people that were writing that weren't getting published. And it wasn't because they weren't good enough to be published. It was simply, it was a tight market back then. And I'm talking about the early 2000s. Mm. And this was when um, online publication was sort of seen as beneath literary fiction. So I have always been into technology ever since, I mean, I, I'm old enough to have been there at the very beginning in the uh, early 90s. So I've always been a, a believer that this was, this was democracy. This was gonna democratize so mm. many things. And um, I went to a very, you know, uh, uptight school, I would say, for my MFA. Okay. And again, like I said, they saw this as, not the way they really thought it should go. They, they really wanted to remain established in, in sort of a print publishing world. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have a set plan going at the very beginning. But as I got into it and I started taking these baby steps, it, it just sort of grew. And what became a blog became a web journal. What became a web journal became a micro press. And that's how it worked out. How long was this process, Jesse, from a blog to turning it into what the micro press is now, which we're going to talk a bit about that in a little while. It, it took, a, for me, it took a while because I'm a very fastidious person. Like I like to do things very carefully mm -hmm. um, because I, I like to respect people's work, you know? And I think mm, throwing important. something together very quickly just because you want something out there and you want your name out there, that's not how I work. I, I take myself out of it and I just want to really showcase talent and respect that talent at the same time. So it took think, me a few years. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important what, what you said about taking the time, right? Like, um, I even feel like now presently, we're in, we're in an industry where everything's going so fast, right? There, there's constant content being produced and I see so many young writers just wanting to jump in head first. I wanted to jump in head first, right? Um, and I think there is th there is something to be commendable in that. But I think also we have to take our time and kind of grow with ourselves while we're going, right? Like we don't want to we don't want to try to publish faster than we're growing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and it's interesting it's interesting to hear that. And and for all of you younger writers out here, emerging writers, take your time with it, right? Like things are going to eventually just blossom and progress, and everything's happening for a reason. It's going your publishing career is going to happen, or you're going to start really hitting that market when it needs to happen. Um, you did also mention that there is this space that is different than it was in the early 2000s with publishing. I do get questions sometimes still about what's what's important in terms of publishing, like who should we be publishing with? Um, does it matter if we publish with more like higher regarded journals? And how important do you think it is to uh, just publish uh, with any press rather than certain presses or certain publications? I think we have the luxury of being able to type in journals and get listings and we can research these places. I don't think you should carpet bomb journals. I don't think you should submit to a gazillion places because not all journals are the same. Mm. Um, 
I, I have a lot of earlier work that I published that there are typos on some of those pages on the web, you know, and that drives me crazy. Uh, so the, yeah. I, I think you have to really do your research. Also, you want to find a place that's going to respect your work, that you're not just going to be treated as another assembly line writer. You want an editor that cares. And that's kind of hard, I know, to tell from just reading an about page. But if you see the work that's being published at a journal and you see how they're, they're treating that work, that gives you an idea of how they're going to treat your work. Mm -hmm. If you see the people that they're selecting to publish, that's going to give you an idea of how you're going to fit into that publication. So take your time. There's so many choices and you will get published. That's not a question. There's a place for everyone. That is not the thing you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on the right place for you to showcase your work. Right. And you know, there's a sense of community in certain places when you're submitting. And personally, that's that's those are the kind of places I like to publish with, right? Uh, where you're going to grow with a community of writers, where there are other writers that feel like they have the same flavors or similar adages as you. And, and there's almost like a common, there, there's a common uh, tonality or like a common ground to both the publisher and the poets or the writers that they're actually publishing, right? Um, when you were when you were speaking about there's some earlier work with that has typos in it, I was like guilty. There, there's a couple of, of poems that I don't list on my website because they did get published with typos. And you know, I mean, it's not necessarily um, uh, their bad. It's also our bad for sending it out with typos. But then again, we're looking at the same poem so many times it kind of glazes over. And then that is when the publisher steps in and the editing steps in. And in order to have a professional page, you know, they editors have a hard job. I mean, if one poetry editor could do it all, but one poetry editor could also be very overwhelmed, right? So it's good if there's a couple of other readers and folks to bounce those ideas off of. Thank you. Um, I do want to start talking about uh, Digging Through Press, which is your baby. Um, this is this is why we're here. Um, but I also want to talk a bit about your own uh, writing journey. Like, where, when did you start writing and how did you get to this point? Okay, well... <laughs> Well, journey is sort of implies that it's sort of like a, a nice and easy going path. That was not the case for me whatsoever. It was not a, a, a direct path in any way. So usually when you're a working class kid, the one thing you know you have to do is get a college education so you can get a good job, so you can get out of wherever it is your living situation is. And so that's what I did. I, I went to school and got a business degree mm. and I hated every second of that every second and i was terrible at it and uh i even had a job on wall street a part-time job oh. i was in a corporate cube bubble place and it was just awful like i i felt so i just didn't belong in that world at all it was just not me i knew it was not me but i just couldn't figure out what what was i what am i and so it took me a very long time. And eventually I, I just quit. I quit it. I just stopped it. I jumped off the train and I decided I need to go back to school. I need to do this over again. And I went back to Hunter College, which is a city university. And you know, it's a lot cheaper than going to a different kind of school. And that allowed me to take some classes in English Lit and work part-time. And my intention was to hit that track and you know eventually get the phd and post-colonial literature was what i wanted to get into wow. and, and i got as far as a master's program i went to queen's college for for I, I think a year yeah two semesters and i was sitting at queen's college's library doing my paper on jameson the literary critic uh because i was really into um marxism and in terms of how marxist uh politics plays into post-colonial literature, anyway. <laughs> and I thought, I don't think I really wanna study this stuff. I think I, I wanna make it. I think I wanna write it. So I quit again. <laughs> and um, then I, I applied for MFA programs and no one wanted me. And so I submitted something to the Breadloaf Writers Conference in Vermont and they took me in. They accepted this. It was like the first time I was 
I got anywhere with my writing. So that was that was great. Bread loaf's a good that that's a good first win. It was it was very validating for yeah. sure. And I was able to meet a few writers and professors there and tried in for the MFA. I got in. Wow. And so that was that's that's been the very ro rocky journey that I've taken. <laughs> Yeah, and, and see, that sounds to me like uh, when you were kind of uh, elaborating on a, a bit of that journey, because it stopped at the MFA. There's so much that probably happened after that MFA to this point right here, right? Um, it's important to have those realizations of saying that, oh, I need to switch. I need to jump ship, right? And I, I feel like there is a lot of friction sometimes with folks wanting to really do their passions and do what they really want, because they do need to chase the dollar, right? Um, like I, I've said to some of my students before in college, I had six different majors before I became an English major. <laughs> um, I always had a knack for writing. I always loved creative writing, but I felt like that wasn't going to put money in my pocket and I was looking to line my pockets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you can do what you're going to need to do for survival, but always think about those passions because those passions can really fuel you. And it's way better to do something that's making you happy, right? rather than something that is just a constant struggle. It does, it, it just wasn't, you know, you always know when you don't fit in and you always know that you have two choices. You can either stay on that train, like I said, or jump while you still can. And, mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes that takes 10 years, sometimes it takes 20 years to realize. Not everybody comes to that point where they can jump off, you know, so easily. And I, I, I understand that because I see, you know, through digging, I see so many writers from all ages. And I know that some of them came into writing a little later in life yeah. because that's when they realized they needed to, you know, pursue this thing. Mm -hmm. Writing is, is a calling. You know, that's the other thing. Writing is not a career, it's a calling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's probably not gonna make you a lot of money. Just writing a good short story is not enough. You right. have to develop your personality. You have to be able to be comfortable in public and speak. You have to uh, learn how to edit. Mm -hmm. You have to just try to figure out as many skills as you can within that framework of literature. And that is what's going to help you succeed. The writing alone, it may help you succeed. You may be a best-selling author in a year, but that's like hitting the lottery. You know, oh. for a lot of people, that's, that's hitting the lottery. But that doesn't mean you can't pursue that that you know dream. You can. Yeah. It's just that be realistic. Also work on other skills while you're going for that dream. Yeah. See, this is what I'm talking about. My most valuable poets. I've said it before. Diversifying your skill set. Right. Thinking of that niche, what you know, and then thinking of different ways you can expound the pound that upon that in order to create a living and in order to make a living. Right. So but that's something too that I don't think I've ever made clear on the channel. Like other writers have said before, and I've said it myself, you're not really gonna make tons of money from writing. But when we're talking about that, we're talking in the scope of our, our, our creative writing, right? But there is money to be made with the skill that we have as a writer, as an editor, as a public speaker, as an educator, as an administrator, as a copy editor, so many different things that fall into writing that it is a gift in and of itself, right? It's a calling, it's a gift. And then you use that calling in order to try to make a couple of dollars in a couple of different avenues, right? Well, it's interesting because like I like I said, I did get a business degree. Right. And uh, I was a terrible student, I mean, terrible, but I did get it. <laughs> and that business degree, I have worked that degree every step of the way. So yes. I took part-time jobs in offices because office work, even though it's tedious, pays a lot of money. Right. And if you're good at it, you can bring work, you know, you can bring your writing to work and you can work on your things in between your job because if you're really good at it, you can get away with it. <laughs> you have to really, you know, you have to be really quick with it. You have to be, you know, on your toes and you have to, hey, you have a desk, you got a copier, you got a printer, you got a computer. Yeah. Free use ink. It. Use it. And I did, I took advantage of a lot of offices. <laughs> but um, eventually I, I did, you know, like I said, I did go to my MFA. Um, how I got to Columbia, I, I actually got a full-time job there first. Uh -huh. Columbia is a very expensive program. 
and I knew that when I applied. So I made sure that I uh, try to get a, a job first, and I did get an office job there, and that came with benefits. So they paid for my first year of my MFA. Awesome. Um, and then you know it got a little hard, so I, I stopped working for the last, the second year. But then when I graduated, I, I went back to Colombia and I, I got a new job. And this job was so much, a much better job because even though it was still a financial administrative job, it was, it was it just, and this is where I work now. It's an amazing office. Uh, it's, it's a very creative office. We're all doing different things. Some of us are students, some of us are artists. Oh, and awesome. so we are doing these sort of, you know, office work, which is very boring, but we're in this very supportive office environment. And luckily for me, I was able to advance and, you know, make a nice living in that way. So the business degree actually paid off for me. Excellent. And, and that's, that's really how that works. So writing for me is, is really a passion. Mm. And that gives me a lot of liberties, I think, because I don't depend on my writing to make a living. Right, I can, right. I can spend seven years on my novel, you know, which, which I have, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and really be happy with what I'm producing, not feeling rushed. Um, but I also, know that you have to be part of that writing world even though you don't need to make a living through that writing you still have to be part of that world and part of that world um, is you have to be part of that community and you have to give back to that community so that people can support you as well right and that's where digging came in it was my way of being able to connect to that community while i was working on my craft you know which which i i continue to do Right. And that's awesome. So let's actually talk about that because I do want to I, I do want to ponder about how we could be in communities without technically just needing to publish all the time. Right. And that is being a good artist steward. Right. Or a good literary steward. And you mentioned digging again. So let's talk about digging press now. So where did the name come from? What's the mission statement of, of digging press? Let's kind of just dig into that. OK, well, I'm a fairly cynical person. <laughs> Uh, so like I said, I went to a very tough program. I, again, didn't really feel like, I didn't feel like I fit in very well in that program. Mm -hmm. I definitely felt like the odd person for many, many reasons. And mm -hmm. that oddness made me feel a little insecure about my writing. And it really kind of screwed up with my head a little bit creatively. But I stuck to it and I pushed through. Um, and so digging through the fat came from I was, I was in class and people would bring, I mean, they would bring these elaborate, long stories. And it was like all these tangential sentences and it was so old fashioned to me. Like, just like, who are you writing to? Who has the time to like, you know, ponder over all this like navel gazing? Like, I just didn't get it. Like, it was just beyond me. And maybe that was because that's my New Yorkness. I don't know, like, I, I like, I want to let's get to it. Point. Uh, and so digging through the fat was really like my response to that. It's like let's just dig through all this, you know, all this stuff and really get to it. And the the original name was digging through the fat, ripping out the heart. Whoa! It's not all these beautiful, pretty sentences that are like never ending. It's writing is about that thing that you're ripping out. You know, that heart. Mm. And, and that's really where that title came. <laughs> okay, so we got that here. And then now in 2021, right? Digging, digging through the fat has this mantra of, of cultural omnivore. So how did that, the ripping of the heart out, right? Very like Wu-Tang Kung Fu. How did that become the cultural, cultural omnivore that, that is uh, Digging Press now? I was a very sheltered, isolated kid. I wasn't really allowed to play outside with the other kids. My parents worked all the time. So there was no one there to like look over at, you know, watch me. And so I, the outside world was everything to me. And the outside world meant television for the most part. And I really studied the hell out of like TV shows. And there was something about the mechanics of 
the stories that were being fed to me from that mm. screen. Anyway, this developed as I got older into an interest in things that were very unfamiliar to me. Like I, I just, I mean, I grew up, at, I'm going to age myself, but I grew up when hip hop was in its infancy. Like this was the eighties, late seventies, early eighties. And it was all around me. Hip hop was all around me. It wasn't an innovative thing to me because it was all around me. Right, right. But punk rock, what's that? Like, mm. what is that? And I was drawn to that kind of stuff where it was just, I knew that wasn't something for me, but I wanted to know more about it. Why can't I know more about it? Mm. And that sort of, that just always stayed with me as, as I grew up and as I developed and as I, as I became an adult, I just had that, you know, curiosity. I just love to discover and I love, and I, and I have a curiosity that I constantly need to feed. Mm. And that took me to all these cultural things, uh, things that because of my background, traditionally that wouldn't have been something that was meant for me. Right, right. That makes sense. So that's where cultural omnivore comes. Like the term itself, I, I read an article, I think it was like an NPR or something like that. And I, I heard the term and I, it has a clinical definition. It's very boring. It's like they have uh -huh. high art and low art. It's just terrible. But I just took it as, hey, I like that stuff and I like that stuff. And all that stuff to me is art. Like, I don't care where it comes from, if it's from the street corner. From, it's all art to me. Yeah. These, these hierarchical definitions are meaningless. It's all art. And so that's where cultural omnivore came from. I love that. And this is a, an exact repeat of that conversation we were having when we were on the podcast, on your podcast, which you'll be able to drop in a little while as well. And the idea of like when we're stepping into our mode as artists, whether it's like painter, whether it's poet, whether it's fiction writer, right? right, Whether it's critic even, because that's an art. We have this tendency to want to box ourselves in, right? And you're like, okay, I'm a poet, so I'm just going to read poetry. I'm a musician, I'm a jazz musician, so I'm just gonna listen to jazz music, right? And everything is just so expansive. I didn't understand until later on, actually, when I was accumulating this book to, which is the baby that you're you're about to publish this month, right? That I didn't know that hip hop and punk rock could exist in that same medium, along with a lot of the things I was learning in academia and along with the things I was learning out on the streets, right? Like it was all encompassing into one experience. Um, to, to begin, right, uh, you're a fiction writer, right? Yeah. Uh, do you write anything else besides fiction, Jesse? I write uh, personal essays. Sometimes I write poetry although okay. I haven't written poetry in a long time. And um, I'm writing a novel, you know, so I started out with short stories and now I'm sort of more of a novelist, I guess, if I get this thing published. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, so the other things that inspired me, film, okay. especially uh, foreign film, because it, again, it's, I don't know what that is. I don't know what they're saying, but I want to see it. <laughs> Right, like like different plot structures as well. Different and different traditions. I mean, there are there the eye, the way the eye works on a camera lens in the United States is very different from the way it tells a story in Japan, and it's very different from how the story is told in India. You know, the eye changes the way that story is being told. So, I was fascinated by that. That that the structure of a story is so different in different cultures. And um, music is a big one that I need it. I need it. I need music to make me happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, art, visual arts, um, all kinds of visual arts, but mostly uh, very contemporary art because I like I like the idea that someone just made something for for me to look at, as opposed to something that was made 400 years ago. That's great too, but. I really like to know the artists and, and that they're alive and they're making this thing right now. So I love, I love contemporary art. How, how do you and Cynthia uh, work creatively in terms of uh, bouncing ideas off of one another? Because both of you are artists in different mediums. Um, for those of you uh, listening in that don't know, Cynthia uh, Alvarez is actually the, the artist of a lot of what goes on at Digging Through Press. And uh, Cynthia Alvarez is also your sister, right? Yeah. 
So can you talk to us about that? Like what, what what's that relationship like? So she she is a hundred percent responsible for all the visuals. What what we do with each other is once she's done creating her piece and I've put together the editing of a chapbook, we sort of just talk about it, you know, how it relates to each other. So but I'm never encroaching on her creativity when it comes to it. I sort of let her have free reign. And um, she usually surprises me because she'll go in a direction that I'm, I was, I was like, cause I, you know, I, every, every person that says they like art thinks they can make art, but right. liking art and making art are two separate things. Right. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. So right. in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I, I would have done this and this. And, oh. and then I, I'll, you know, she'll show me something. I'm like, oh, well, that's her little, um, that's her world. And we're just able to communicate those two worlds um, and we have um, a dialogue about it. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and by the way, like Cynthia's cover for the book like knocks my socks off. Like literally, it is so beautiful. And then a lot of the stuff that's happening on the inside of the book, uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. Like I, I can't wait for this book to like be in the world and, and we're able to, you know, talk about it and have readings about it and such so so thank you for that um this is thinking in the scope of some of my some of my subscribers that might want to submit to digging press at some point uh what what is your vision uh, of manuscripts when you're looking through manuscripts what are you looking for i i actually try not to have many thoughts when i read through them mm. because um I, I don't want to bring my baggage to the table you know uh because i definitely have a my writing style is very different from the stuff I publish. It's completely different. Um, I'm not looking for people that write like me. Mm. I'm looking for something that I, you know, would never have thought of doing myself and be moved by it. And so it, it's hard because I go to AWP and people want to know, well, what are you looking for exactly? And it's like, well, surprise me. <laughs> you know, Just make sure it's very well written. I mean, you know, just make sure you spend time, you're crafting, you're proud of what you're submitting and that's going to communicate, you know, that's going to communicate to the editor. Um, and of course you are in competition with other manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And so you can't take rejection personally ever because mm -hmm. it really has nothing to do with you and, and your efforts. It, it's really about the people that the editor is looking at at that moment in time. And there's just going to be one piece that for whatever reason, that's the piece that the editor is drawn to. Mm -hmm. And there are many reasons for that. It's usually not merit, you know, mer everyone has merit on that table. It's just the thing that the one manuscript that speaks to you. Yeah. Yeah. Publishing really is just time, right? Yeah. It, uh, submitting it to a place at that right time, at the right time where the star is aligning with the planet, which is aligning with the computer screen, which is al aligning with that light coming through to that person, right? It's, it's just all of those little things. So yeah, I definitely know for a fact that that line of don't take it personal it's something we hear so many times, but it hits so hard because it's almost hard to not take it personal because it's something so vulnerable to us, right? When, when we're actually putting our words out there. But yeah, there is opportunity out there. There are other places. Um, just just keep going. Don't don't do like Jesse said. Don't don't just submit everywhere. Make sure you're ready for it, right? But once you're ready, it's going to land somewhere. So I'm a big fan of uh, the Penguin Pocketbook series. Okay. Um, and uh, what Penguin does is they, they republish short works in these beautiful little books. Yes. It's right here. Yes, little pocket okay. books. And they always do such a wonderful job of how they package these books. Like they're basically reintroducing these works to the world. Mm -hmm. And some of these works were successful and some of them weren't, you know, and then they gain success because they're being republished this way. Uh, I just love that idea of, of the pocket book because Reading should be accessible and it should be carried. Like I, I used to carry books around all the time in my pocket. Like I always had a book in my pocket when I was younger. And I know this was like the stone ages, but like, you know, I was in, I was in the East Village, you know, watching the, the skating boys and I had my pocket full of books and that's what I did, you know, and I would go to the used bookstores and get more books. 
And that was my life for about 10 years. You know, that's what I did. Um, so that that's where the, the idea for, of the size of that chapbook came from. Uh, we also wanted to have someone submit something and then let us create something beautiful with it. So someone can pick up and really, again, that word respect comes into the picture. Like I wanted this work to be respected, to be looked at, you know, with, with respect as opposed to something disposable. Mm -hmm. um, not to knock, you know, other journals because I know publishing is very hard and, and it's very expensive and materials sometimes you just, you do the best you can. And there are many publishers that, you know, even though they're spending a lot of money on the production value, they're still putting out really beautiful books because they're, you know, they're trying to do the best they can. Um, but like I said, I went, I have a business degree and I just, you know, I can afford to make a beautiful book. I'm going to make a beautiful book. <laughs> and that's what I do. Yeah. Well, when, um, when are submission periods open for the micro chat book series? So I think this year we're going to open up a little early, um, in July, I think, yeah, I think it's July 15th through the fall. Um, just to give opportunities, you know, we, I definitely am looking for more fiction submissions. We get a lot of poetry, we mostly get poetry. Mm -hmm. And of course I love publishing poetry, but I'm really curious, like I wanna see a fiction writer think about how to package their fiction in that short way, in that short book, as opposed to a collection or a novel, yeah. um, even like a novella. Like I'm a big fan of the novella. Mm -hmm. I haven't Makes gotten sense. a novella yet and I really want to get one. You know, as, as a poet, I really like novellas because they're on the shorter side. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely are, they definitely are. <laughs> I can imagine a, a nice novella or like a, a flash, you know, like a couple of flash or a, what are those 100 word stories called? Uh, a drabble? Is that a drabble? I don't know. I forget. <laughs> but they even have like a hundred character stories now because of like Twitter and stuff. So yeah, yeah. there's so many different kind of compressed versions of literature. Yes. Yeah. Do you all publish on the website? So we publish, uh, we do different things at different periods of time. So this year we are doing flash fiction. Actually, it ends at the end of this month um, and fiction. So that we have an open submission for that. And then later on in the year, probably in November-ish, we'll open up uh, to poetry submissions. Uh, so that's what we've been doing so far. We, we occasionally do essays, but they really have to grab me. So it's a lot harder to find essays in an open submission period. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you feel that you have an essay that you absolutely love and you want to get out in the world, email it to me and you know we'll consider it through email uh but i don't do an open submission for those okay and and how how would they reach you there's uh we have a website diggingpress.com or digging through the fat.com both take you to the same place and there is a menu look for the submission button on there and you, you can also find us at submittable excellent and are you all on social media we're on social media, we're on Facebook as Digging Press, Twitter, Instagram. So yes, all Digging awesome. Press. Excellent. And where can they find you, Jesse Alva, as the writer? Um, well, if you really need to find me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on all those places too, but I'm on there as Cult Omnivore. So you can, you can link to me on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'm not on Facebook. I do have a Facebook account, but I'm not on it as as much as you would, I think people would want me to be, so. A lot of information overload on Facebook these days. I'm just so turned off by it. So I I, I just yeah. don't post on it. I, we do have a group on Facebook, a Friends of Digging group. Uh, so when you're published, I usually try to link you in, but again, email me if you want to get linked to that, because that, you'll get a direct hit of all the things that we're publishing. So, excellent. Um, Jesse, I always close out with these questions, uh, kind of like that last golden nugget of information. First, thank you so much for hanging out and kicking it on Dimitri Reyes Poet. Um, it was excellent for you to be here. I am humbled that you will be publishing every 1st and 15th this month. I am so proud that this is going to be my first baby and it's amazing that it's happening under the auspices of you and Cynthia. It's, it, it's been so great to work with you. Well, we loved working on your book, so we can't wait for that June 30th date. June 30th, people, put it on your calendar. <laughs> Last question. 
what do you know now that you wish you did know at the beginning of your writing career? Hmm. You know how they, they always tell you, write what you know? Mm. That's a terrible piece of advice. <laughs> it's really terrible. Um, you should not write what you know. You should write what makes you really uncomfortable. Ooh. And you should spend time doing that and really working with that for a bit. And then you should write what you know. Because I think so many people start writing what they know and it's like, well, I grew up here and I walked here and I did this and nobody cares. But once you dig, you gotta really dig in and find the real true story inside of you. That's, that's what makes you unique. And that's the thing that's gonna come out. I look at you and I just think of the word dig. <laughs> right? There's so much of that. And and by the way, that answer was so punk rock and so hip hop. Right? Everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, just write what you know. And you're like, no, screw that. Write what's hard. Right? Oh man, thank you. And that is so important. Write what hurts and, and write your way into succession. Man, that's deep. I'm actually going to take that and I'm going to remove that. I'm going to remove the write what you know from the syllabi that I have. So, so. <laughs> So I'll be scratching that out as soon as I get Sorry. <laughs> Jesse said no. <laughs> uh, all right, all my MVPs. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I will see you all in the next class. Uh, the 30th of this month, I'm dropping a documentary. So do stick around. Um, it's all going to be stuff from every 1st and 15th. So stay tuned. Jesse, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, Jesse, that was perfect. Oh, gosh. <laughs>